Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to SHFM's Critical Issues Conference Series Finale. My name is Damian Monticello, and I'm your SHFM president. My day job is being the Senior Manager of Corporate Hospitality Services at Guidewell. Thank you so much for joining us today for the final installment in the CIC series. The 2021 CIC series is spotlighting people, the human side of hospitality. On behalf of the Critical Issues Advisory Committee, we welcome you. Today's SHFM educational programming was developed by your peers. I want to extend a huge thank you to all the individuals on the CIC advisor group who lent their time and expertise. I want to give a special thank you to the CIC co-chairs, Eric Cooley and Sunita Devi for their outstanding leadership of this group. I would also want to say a big thank you to our generous CIC sponsors. These companies have stepped up to provide the resources we need to deliver outstanding educational events like this one. Thank you so very much. To show your support for the CIC sponsors, I encourage you all to explore the CIC Solutions Center. You will find things like state-of-the-art equipment and services, unique food, beverage, and delivery options, integrated turnkey technology, resources for workplace transformations and inspiration, and so much more. We'll go ahead and put the link in the chat so you can bookmark it for later on. Before we begin, we do have a few housekeeping notes that we need to go over. Please ask your questions throughout the session in the Q&A window located in your, in your toolbar. We'll have some time for Q&A at the end, but be sure to ask those questions throughout the entire session. I see several attendees already utilizing the chat window. We'd love to know you're here with us, so please drop us a friendly hello in the chat. This year's CIC advisory group added a charitable, a charitable component to the conference and selected World Central Kitchen as our recipient. SHFM members raised $3,000 and counting for World Central Kitchen. Additionally, SHFM made a donation on behalf of our speakers, which is included in our total. I'm also happy to announce that Karen and Mike DePerry from the Academy for Hospitality Arts donated $1,500 to our total, and I want to thank them for their fundraising efforts. We are thrilled to give this $3,000 to World Central Kitchen, who deals with the critical issue of food security every day. Thank you to all of our SHFM family for being so generous. As you may know, for every $10 donated, donors were eligible for a chance to win one of several exciting raffle prizes thanks to our sponsors. Those winners will be announced at the end of this session, so be sure to stay until the end of the session to see if you are one of our lucky winners. Lastly, this session is being recorded so it can be played on demand. The recording will be available on SHFM's website and YouTube channel later this week. Preparing for this session, I was reminded of a comment by Betty Wiggins in our first session on leadership, where Betty mentioned, take care of your people, your people will take care of your customers, and your customers will take care of everything else. Well, after two great sessions, we've arrived at the everything else. We have some phenomenal speakers today during the final installment of the CIC series, Connecting with Customers. To tell you more about this session and our speakers, it's my pleasure to introduce today's session host, Justin Williams. Justin is a Senior Vice President at Wells Fargo and is part of the Workplace Services and Experience team focused on understanding amenity trends, influence, and the needs of employees in the workplace. Prior to joining Wells Fargo, Justin was at Morgan Stanley for over 11 years where he was the head of amenities for the Americas. Justin, over to you. Thank you, Damien. I'm thrilled to be your host today. In today's session, we're gonna dive in with industry research and communication experts. They will share information and ideas on what the customer is looking for in a changing culture to better shape how you can connect with your customers. I actually looked up the definition of customer, which is a person of a specified kind that one has to deal with. And searches revealed that there are supposedly between four to 16 types of customers. We ourselves know that your customer depends on the perspective of your work type, such as client liaison, vendor, supplier, internal customer. 
How we dealt with those customers has changed with COVID, especially with the loss of in-person meetings. In today's session, in today's session, we're going to hear from Dr. Marie Puy Barreau on how changes in our working preference will shape our experience, as well as the expectation of what customers want from companies and how we work. Dr. Marie is a globally recognized thought leader on the future of work and human experience with a significant track record of research on corporate real estate, facility management, workplace industry futures, workplace innovation, technologies, and generational issues at work. Since 2015, she leads the global research program for JLL Corporate Solutions. Dr. Marie's latest research focuses on the future of work, human experience, workplace trends, flex space, metrics, and human performance. Dr. Marie's recent projects contributed to set the vision of JLL Corporate Solutions and supported the transformation strategy around the future of work. Dr. Marie, pleasure to have you. Uh, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Justin, for the introduction and the, the nice welcome. Uh, I can see a big crowd coming from all over, you know, the US. It's really fantastic. I'm sitting here in France, in uh, in in the Dordogne, in the southwest of France, uh, and really, really pleased to be uh, joining this uh, this conference to share my insight and to share what I've learned about how we can, uh, you know, connect with, uh, you know, with customers. So let me uh, uh, shift my, uh, you know, slide. Okay, I think I have a problem with the slide. So can you move on to the next one, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's look at um, how we can shape, uh, you know, human experience and what have we learned from, uh, you know, workforce, uh, you know, preferences. Uh, I've been carrying out, uh, you know, quite a lot of uh, research around this topic since, uh, you know, the crisis, uh, you know, emerged even before that. But you know, since March, uh, you know, last year, we've been extremely concerned to try to monitor how the workforce was embracing the whole turmoil around, uh, you know, the pandemic and what does this mean in terms of understanding, you know, the, the, the future of work. So the, the research that I'm going to make reference to, uh, you know, today is, uh, uh, is the you know, research which uh, we've um, been carrying out throughout last year and reporting on the latest uh, result from uh, November 2020. So if you move on to the next slide, please. Um, you'll see, uh, you know, the size of the panel that, uh, you know, we interviewed. I mean, I do a lot of this research and it's, uh, it's really fascinating to look at how workforce preferences are, are shifting, especially in time of, uh, of major crises as what we had over, you know, the last year. I mean, you've all heard about uh, uh, and leaps through uh, how you know the, the 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 major lockdown forced us to work from home, and and that was a a, a mass scale experiment for a lot of uh, you know corporate occupiers and uh, and investors you know throughout the world to test test their workplace model, test the resilience also of their workforce through the crisis, and they're now at the stage at an inflection point where they they're looking at what do they need to design better design, adjust as part of their, you know, portfolio and their real estate uh, uh, to welcome back the workforce into the best condition. So I'm going to rely a lot on the data set which I have collected in November 2020. We are just about to release the new data set at the beginning of May 2021, which is a continuity to this study and a, a basically a repeat to really try to understand how those workforce preferences have, have shifted and what can we expect uh, towards you know, the end of the year uh, and how should we adjust to it. So watch out for uh, this new survey. You've also heard, if you move to the next slide, you've also heard into a previous webinar, my colleague Robert uh, presenting into a great amount of detail some of, uh, you know, of these results. And today I really want to, um, you know, remind you about it first. Um, and, uh, you know, this is online on the, on the website and you will be able to watch it if you want to hear more background. Uh, but also, um, to, to look at the, you know, the what's next, you know, when we think about connecting with customers, uh, you know, the, the learning from those survey are telling us something about the future and the future of work. And that's what I'm going to concentrate on. So moving on to, to the next slide, 
uh, we're seeing that hybrid work is on the agenda of, I would say, more than 80% of our clients at the moment. I have daily presentation around this topic. They are on one hand seizing the opportunity around hybrid work uh, to look at how they can boost their resilience, especially in relation to other crises which may come our way in, in the future. But also looking at uh, uh, what is happening at the moment as a significant accelerator to build their competitive advantage. And hybrid work is something they are looking at into detail, uh, planning to deploy at a small scale or at a large you know, scale. And uh, investing, investing a lot into boosting that notion of human experience, human performance through an hybrid model. So if you move to the next slide, I'm going to share with you our definition of hybrid. So it's a very simple definition. It, it's about a flexible way of working that involves sometimes being physically present in a corporate office and sometimes working in a distributed manner, uh, leveraging cloud technologies to enable work from everywhere. Um, in the data that Robert presented you uh, on April you know, the 8th, he, he, he recapped what is the distribution across office, home and anywhere. We are seeing that we still have a big cohort of the workforce who wants to return to an office. This is an excellent news for us in the real estate world um, because you know clearly this return to the office is a big anchor into the life of a, of a, you know, of a worker. But they also see home as an opportunity to spend time in and an opportunity to improve the quality of life. Um, clearly, access to other places, third party places like co-working environment is also, uh, you know, very strong. But right there in the middle, 66 percent are ready to adopt an hybrid way of working. And that's what our attention needs to be really focused on. So hybrid is one thing and there are multiple models across hybrid. What is very important and what I really want you to understand is that we are also talking about the future of work continuum. Because what the crisis has uh, you know, brought to us is the fact that work is something we do. It's something you do. It's not some anymore somewhere you go to. The workforce is getting much more um, talent centric. And we're hearing from large organizations that they want to put a lot of emphasis on, on attracting, retaining this talent. This is one of the key uh, trends emerging at the moment uh, or the dynamism around workforce preferences, workforce demand, um, um, you know, on our market. The workplace is about working from anywhere and the portfolio, as we look at it in real estate, will need to be much more flexible, what we call much more elastic, and we need to optimize this elasticity in the future. So it's, it's a really interesting way to look at how things are changing and how, you know, the connection with those customers called the workforce uh, is important and how we connect also to our customers being our clients and how they're embracing very rapidly that notion of, uh, you know, hybrid work. But the learning is goes beyond that. And if you move to the next, uh, you know, slide, please, uh, we are uh, also looking at you know, the data through, you know, different, uh, you know, angle. Work from home is here to stay. We're not exactly sure about what is going to be the proportion of time spent at home versus spent in the office. But what we know is that your level of engagement, your empowerment, the way you fulfilled, very much depend on having the right mix between being in an office and having that flexibility to work from anywhere and work you know, from home. And as you can see here, we've identified a breaking point between two and three days. So at the, you know, the moment we, we are looking at three days at home, two days in the office, it seems to be shifting uh, towards, uh, uh, you know, slightly more time uh, spent, uh, spent in the office rather than, you know, spent at home. But those data are very important because they're showing us uh, the importance of being together in an office and the importance also of having that high level of flexibility to work from anywhere you want. 
So let's focus a little bit more on uh, the notion of work from home. If you move to the next uh, you know, slide, it has been a key priority for uh, the, the, the extreme large majority of our clients for, for more than a year. And the large scale experiment around work from home was, for me, from a research point of view, a fantastic fantastic way to progress with, uh, you know, our thinking and evolving the future of work model. So on the next slide, I'd like to share with you the cultural differences, because when we work from home, I mean, clearly, depending on where, you know, you are based, which region you are based, you may have a very, uh, um, you know, you, um, uh, American centric, you know, point of view. But the notion of work from home is very different across, uh, you know, the, the three region. Uh, and there's um, a lot of opportunities emerging around work from home in Asia Pacific compared to, uh, you know, the state they were before, uh, you know, COVID-19. Across here in Europe, um, there's, uh, as you know, it, it's actually quite regulated. It's not that easy to implement work from home. There are a lot of issues associated with tax and, uh, and, and policies and regulation. Uh, and the U.S. seems to be embracing also very quickly uh, you know, that notion. So we're seeing some real cultural differences, which can also be embedded within your own, you know, region. So it's important to uh, to look at that notion and, and fall back on a mix of time between work from home and in the office, which is suitable. And that's what I'm showing on the next slide. And I'm sharing with you here a couple of uh, the latest results from our March 2021, you know, survey. Um, we were seeing uh, in November uh, that um, most people were happy to spend 2.4 days outside of the office. It seems to be shifting now towards 2.1 days outside of the office, which is a good news because um, the return to the office is going to be uh, you know, much stronger, more towards three days per week rather than two days per week. It's an important point because when we think about connecting with customers, you connect with them within an office environment, most likely within that physical space. That's where you've got the, the biggest opportunity. And the fact that they're going to spend three days uh, uh, in an office means that you ha will have much more opportunity to deploy, you know, human experience, uh, you know, issues. So important to look at that. And as I say, watch for uh, the, the release of this result in May 2021, which are going to go into much more, you know, detail about, uh, about this. If you move on to, to the next slide, and Robert shared with you a little bit of uh, uh, insight also on, on this topic, but what we're seeing is that we do have a big cohort of the workforce, which is not only looking to embrace work from home, but they are also looking to increase the quality of life. So notion around choosing their working hours, around living far away from the cities, uh, switching to four days, uh, you know, work with, seems to be very, very strong. We're not too sure if they are going to be permanent, you know, changes or if there are temporary changes. This is something which we will see across the, the other survey we'll do in, uh, in 2021. But saying this, those who actually embrace full-time work from home seems to be much more appealed by moving away from a physical location. Again, it's going back to this mix between the two and the three days balance between working at home and working in an office. The more people spend time in the office, the more they are attached to uh, you know, this uh, physical environment and the more they are asking for uh, you know, higher level of services uh, you know, within this. So the landscape is changing. And if you move on to the next slide, please, we're seeing that although the landscape is changing in the background, that societal expectations are changing, that the workforce preferences are also shifting and probably are going to be ingrained for a very long time, the office still plays a crucial role. And this is very, very important. I've said it already, the office is not going to die. We are going to spend quality time, collaborative time, social time into, uh, into an office. And if you move on to the next slide, this is another view of, you know, across uh, different, uh, you know, continents around employee readiness to move to hot desking. This is an important trigger and a lever to accelerate, you know, change. We're seeing that some countries are ready to shift well above, you know, global average. And again, those are the Asian countries. 
it's good because in Asia, they were much more conservative. They were really contemplating uh, uh, work in the office as the only solution. We are seeing that more and more you know, across the world, uh, the fact that people are ready to embrace uh, not to have a dedicated desk uh, is a really good sign that they are ready to switch and ready to embrace, you know, this hybrid model, ready to, uh, you know, to move on. And it's even stronger, if we move to the next slide, when those who spend, um, uh, you know, full time uh, at home, are clearly more ready to, uh, you know, give up the seat. And, and if you think about it, if we still had even a cohort of what, 30, 20, 30% of the population will remain, uh, you know, at home, three days or more, that gives us potential to really start looking differently at what an office uh, purpose, you know, is and start to really rethink how we redesign, uh, you know, offices. We do have a cohort, you know, 57%, the one who work full time from the office, who still are still very attached, very territorial. Uh, so moving on to, to the next slide, I mean, one of the big conclusion of all my research for one year is that, you know, 2021, we're entering the new golden age of, uh, of the worker. This uh, people first, human centric, um, um approach is it is it, it, really starting to be fully ingrained into the way companies talk about their future and the future of work and it's an important point because if we take a step back and look at the next uh, you know slide please you know 2020 at Ronaders um a lot of question a lot of challenges um we know work is happening in the cloud we know the mental load of the crisis is, is, uh, is really shifting our priorities. We have a liquid workforce more and more dispersed. Um, there's a whole ecosystem emerging around you know, the workplace. It's becoming more work and worker centric. Uh, the, the, the office is also clearly helping to structure the working life. And that's why the return to an office is extremely important. And with that, the hybrid first model is emerging as well as the need to disperse a little bit more your footprint to have what we call a liquid footprint. But there are six fundamental questions which we keep having. How is work being done, being performed? And it's not about where work is done, it's how is work done. That's where the conversation is starting with a lot of our customers at the moment. The, and our clients want to connect to their customers, their employees, to, and understand how work is done. They also, spending a lot of time looking at the workforce preferences. And, and they do those two steps before they start thinking about what is the right size of the box, the workplace itself. And it's only when they understand it that they can start looking at the hybrid work model, the future hybrid work model, as potentially a way to uh, satisfy on one hand this, uh, this demanding, new demanding workforce, but also building their competitive advantage, transforming their culture and maintaining, uh, uh, you know, this culture also in, in the long term and building their resiliency. So those six questions are really fundamental. And this is where a lot of activity is going to take place in the future. So to finish this uh, presentation, uh, if you move on to, uh, you know, the next uh, slide, please, just three things which I really want you to remember when we think about uh, uh, what I have presented. Um, the need to decode the long-term impact of remote work on working and living patterns, absolutely crucial. The, the most advanced customers that we work with at the moment do employee sensing at least once a month, very frequent per survey. And they've been doing that for those who are the most advanced since March last year. Size, size the opportunity to sustain and reinvigorate employee engagement. It's absolutely crucial that we think about um, meeting the need 
of this new demanding workforce. And it is about retrofitting, redesigning, but also rethinking the workplace, rethinking the purpose of the workplace into a great amount of detail. And you will see that in my next survey, uh, you know, result, we are going to really present this into much more detail. And building a worker-centric workplace, it's a people-first approach. It's a human-centric design. We need to think about embedding new services. And Contest and Andrew afterwards, uh, you know, after my presentation, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail, you know, about it. So that's it for, for today uh, in terms of, uh, you know, my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, you can connect with me and please ask me some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Marie. Uh, hybrid work is probably the biggest challenge we all face, and we're all waiting to see how this is going to work out. Please be sure to drop questions in the Q&A box for, for Dr. Uh, Marie, and we'll get to those at the end of the session. Next up, we're going to be joined by a pair of speakers who will share key insights from the 2021 Annual Trends Report produced by AF & Co and Carbonate specifically focusing on a few ways that 2020 actually accelerated some positive changes and who doesn't like silver linings. These insights will offer a glimpse inside customers' minds, what customer trends and behaviors will be carried forward into 2021 and beyond. I would like to welcome Andrew Freeman, who is the founder and president of AF & Co a boutique agency specializing in marketing and media relations for restaurants, hotels, and lifestyle brands. In 2005, Andrew launched AF & Co, which has developed and launched concepts, created unique culinary events, provided ongoing marketing and public relations, consultants, uh, sorry, consulting for over 300 restaurants and hotels. In 2019, Andrew co-founded Carbonate, a creative strategy and brand communications agency to offer expanded brand development and launch services. And also, I would like to introduce Candice McDonald. She is the co-founder and managing director of Carbonate. She has worked for a range of clients from large corporations to multi-concept restaurants, uh, operators in Silicon Valley startups. Prior to launching Carbonate, Candice was Managing Director of Consultancing Services at AF & Co, where she led a team in creating, launching, and refining brand identities. Candice and Andrew, over to you. Hello, 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 hello. I'm Andrew. I think you can probably figure out that I'm Andrew, and that's Candice. <laughs> Um, it's a pretty easy way. Well, we're so excited, Marie, that presentation was really fascinating because, you know, one, obviously, as people that specialize in, uh, in restaurants and food service operations, we, want, we, we sort of want people to get back to work and, um, and start going out to restaurants again and coming to our cities again and doing all that. And though I do think there's, in everything, there's opportunity, um, you know, the silver linings as we were talking about. Um, because we're on a limited amount of time, we do have a complete trend report, which you can um, enjoy at your leisure. You can find it at either of our websites. So uh, I mean, I encourage you to check it out. But today, we're going to focus just on four major trends that we saw that really did have an impact on how the world will change. But a little bit about us first, you heard for in the intro what we do. Uh, AFCO has been around for 15 and a half years. We celebrated our 15th during the pandemic. Um, and, um, and we're based here in San Francisco in the Bay Area. And our focus is butts and seats and heads and beds. That's if you really uh, had to assess how we do what we do, that's our total goals. Um, in working with crowds, crowds like yours or companies like yours, we're also interested in how we're gonna deliver great experiences to employees, employers, et cetera. And just keeping, you know, on top of how to keep your uh, food service going in a in a great direction. So I'll let Candice tell you a little bit about Carbonate. But since there was we there was such a good job in the introduction, we can, we'll we'll keep this going pretty quickly. Yeah, Carbonate uh, is a creative services agency. So as Andrew mentioned, you know, our focus is always on looking at how we can help um, experiences and companies stand out. And I think uh, that leads really nicely into uh, what we're here to talk to you about today, because um, we do every year um, 
in order as part of our work, uh, develop an annual trend report to kind of understand what forces are going to be shaping hospitality um, and restaurants and hotels in particular are our focus. Um, so today, a lot of the examples we're going to share with you come from our trend report. Um, and uh, what we're really talking about is uh, taking a look at, you know, what what should what should we um, what do we want to carry forward from last year, which seems like a little bit of a funny topic. Um, but as I mentioned, every year we do this trend report. And uh, last year, uh, March of 2020, Andrew and I were presenting it at the Culinary In Institute of America, and it was the last time we presented that particular report because right then we all went into lockdown. And um, you know, in the summer, we started to say to ourselves, you know, what are we really going to do here? You know, what is, let's look back at this report. And what we discovered actually was, you know, a lot of the, the forces that we felt were impacting the industry were, were still in play in 2020 and, in fact, had been accelerated. So a lot of what we're going to talk to today really um, reflects what we're calling, you know, this disruption to acceleration, which is really the movement pattern that, that um that we feel shape the hospitality industry. Um, so um, with that, let's let's uh, focus on some good things that we experienced last year. Yes. Andrew, I'll let you uh, yeah, okay, great. kick it and, off. And by the way, disruption, you know, you can go in quotes was the pandemic, um, but we thought we'd keep it positive. And our trend report was called Do the Hustle, um, primarily because that's what we all had to do, you know, to get through the last year. I Normally I would sing on this presentation, but Candace told me how to cut it. Uh, for time, but yeah, 15 uh, minutes. There's no time. But, for okay, thinking. but my recording, <laughs> the recordings of my favorite tunes. You know, just text me or email me, and I'll I'll sing for you personally. Okay, but let's talk about the first way that you know we feel, uh, you know, that we've been changed for the better. Um, well, we learned it's all about connection, and no matter what, um, I think connection was so important during the last year. Um, you know, in in the pre-pandemic, you know, it was all about interactive, being with people, being in restaurants, being at hotels, traveling, et cetera. And, you know, delivery was just, you know, starting. It was there. We were talking about it. There were some ghost kitchens that sort of had started to make, you know, a little wave. And then, man, talk about what, a, you know, what 2020 did for this. Well, we went uh, contactless. You know, we went definitely where you know, not only were we seeing opportunities to present products like the salad making robot that you see in this picture, but the term curbside and um, pickup and delivery took on a whole new meaning, as did Zoom connections and interactive tastings and everything that you could do online to sort of replace the experiences that we were missing by literally not being able to go out. Um, and all this was done with the opportunity to um, you know, really get creative and bring some great experiences. I'm sure you've all attended virtual tastings and you've done meetings and you've had food delivered and all that. So as we look towards today, um, we're not, I think we're going to end up in a really nice place. You know, this is the silver lining here. We're going to have great companies that started, um, you know, had the amazing ability to do delivery services and also look at raising the bar on hospitality in these services. But we've also looked at the elevation of great delivery and pickup services. But the good news is, everybody, we're back in business, right? And so I would definitely see, I encourage you all to uh, start thinking about what your food service will look like in a way that'll feel safe, safe and healthy and uh, will provide less waste because that's a big topic. And then certainly going back out to restaurants, but you know things like print menus might go to QR codes. We don't know where this is all going to land, but there's a lot of good that did come out of last year when it came to connection. You know, the second thing, the big takeaway um, from in twenty uh, in coming out of last year is we really shined a light on systematic bias and we're as an industry raising the bar on inclusion. Um, and, you know, this is not a, a completely, um, you know, again, this is one of those things that really accelerated pre pandemic. We had um, a lot of discussion about what American food was, you know, we really were looking at the phrase new American fare, and that was really being redefined to reflect the experiences in the restaurant space, at least the experiences of, sh of chefs who maybe identified with the culture of their families, but who grew up here in the US, which really gave them a uniquely um, 
you know, American in air quotes experience. So, you know, you see here examples. This is um, an Asian inspired Texas barbecue, uh, Marlowe and Sons, which is um, in Williamsburg, you know, transitioned to a Japanese farm inspired restaurant in 2019 to really reflect that, you know, who, who they were and their experience. So we started to see a lot of that happening um, in 2019. During the pandemic, um, you know, we realized how, how far we have to go. Um, the doors really uh, opened and we saw a lot of injustices. Um, you know, and as it relates to hospitality companies, you know, companies really had to walk the walk and words weren't enough. Um, empty support was called out on social media and, you know, silence was considered complacency. So again, this is not something relegated to hospitality by any means, but as it relates to food and its connection to culture, um, you know, it came to light that the industry really has an opportunity to, um, you know, to be a part of this conversation in a very meaningful way. Um, and you saw that, you know, we've got, this was Bakers Against Racism, which raised, you know, tons of money in a very creative way. Um, we see it in the media outlets that cover food and wine. This is the new editor of Bon Appetit, who was uh, replaced after, um, you know, a, a leadership shakeup there. So, you know, and we saw some hospitality companies making really big commitments of which we would anticipate that they're going to be held accountable for. Um, so what does that mean going forward? Um, you know, we're seeing companies continuing to take a stand. Um, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, we're evaluating representation and what does that mean? And I think we're also seeing um, that we're carefully embracing a broader food culture. Um, so, you know, how does this relate? This is definitely uh, both an internal and external issue, you know, so companies have to consider what they're doing to create an inclusive food culture for those who are preparing um, their food, as well as those who are going to, um, you know, it's being prepared for. Um, you know, certain things like we can really no longer use the word ethnic in the same way. It's really come to mean some lesser than, or it's kind of become a little bit of a shortcut for saying non-white. Um, and so things like that need to be struck from the vocabulary. There's a picture there of, you know, a conversation this earlier this year about, you know, is, is having, even having an ethnic food aisle, is, is there anything inherently racist about that? Or are we separating out those um, types of food that have really been, become a part of the American, um, uh, you know, palette, if you will. Um, we definitely see this as it relates to, you know, introduction of new menu items and how we carefully do that. Um, and if you might've seen that there were some, a uh, little bit of a media shakeup, you know, when Shake Shack unveiled um, a Korean fried chicken sandwich that they put a lot of research and effort into and had been successful for them in Korea actually. Um, but many questioned uh, if that was cultural misappropriation. So there's these kinds of things need to be explored and carefully evaluated. Um, on the positive, we're seeing, you know, some the rise of some really independent um, passion projects and pop-ups that reflect people's roots. Um, you know, you've got Cora Bakery there. Um, Lazy Susan is a new restaurant chain opening in um, San Francisco that's focused on um, really reinventing Chinese American food and kind of taking that as at its at its worth um, as its own type of food. Um, and really, the the react the, the reality is that Gen Z is the most diverse uh, generation yet, and so this idea of cultural awareness uh, is not a novelty for them. It's really a part of their experience, you know. Whereas we might have seen earlier generations kind of searching for authentic adventures, um, really, that's that's it's not the case when you're talking about um, welcoming Gen Z to the scene. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say, as before we jump into this one, I would encourage you all to walk really walk the talk. Um, and look at inside your organization and outside. And yeah, I know many of you are probably involved in the Multicultural Food Service and Hospitality Alliance. And I would suggest that you do look into that MFHA, but you know, there's the way you're gonna reinvent your food service programs. You really have to think about this because at the heart of it, we're all American. Okay, and by the way, there's gonna be a great New York Times piece on Chinese American food in the next week. So <laughs> keep, an, keep an eye out for that, okay. Plant-based is here to stay. And what a week it's been because Epicurious announced that they're not gonna cover meat anymore, um, which, you know, is a pretty big thing. Well, so we were on, we were ahead of this one, <laughs> um, you know, in our trend report pre-pandemic, we, uh, 19, we um, announced that vegan was, go was going viral. Um, and yet, even though we, we were very proud of that, we realized that it was still sort of a, um, a niche, if you will, it, you know, there was, um, you know, the vegans were speaking up and they were getting great restaurants such as Wild Seed, which is here in San Francisco, but also products were being made, you know, with the vegan mindset or just like, you know, catering to that audience. And then for all of us who were sort of interested in it, it was, it was great because it wasn't maybe the, um, you know, the un 
pleasant food that we thought it might be. It was delicious and we were learning a lot about it. So we thought, okay, that's great. And then in 2020, we predicted, uh, so plant-based, which is, you know, somewhere between eating, you know, the way we, you know, the majority of uh, folks eat and vegan. And that was just using plant-based foods. And, and that in 2020, we predicted was going to go mainstream. And I think where it really showed up was, you know, uh, the fast food industry was all introducing vegan chicken nuggets or, um, you know, meat substitutes, plant-based meat substitutes. As you probably all know, that was, that's still a very big craze. Even Ikea is announcing that their meatballs are going to, there's going to be a meatless version of their meatballs. So, I think that, you know, we, we went plant-based and you know what I love about this every, oh, can you just go back one real quick? Um, uh, what I, Candace is rushing me. Okay. Um, what I love about this is that, um, you know, the, um, the opportunity for restaurants and menus now is that it's not being separated into, oh, here's everything that we offer. And here's the, the one salad and the one, uh, veggie plate that's, for the vegans or the vegetarians. It's now just being incorporated into the menu. So it's really mainstream. Okay, jump ahead. Okay, so today we sort of take what Candace just talked about, which is, you know, what does the um, American palate look like? And it's a global, it's global. And so what, well, this is so exciting, everybody. You know, I hope, I can't see you all, but I hope you're really excited about this because this is taking the plant-based movement and now bringing it into globally based foods, um, which, and there's, we have Italian restaurants that have opened up that are completely vegan or vegetarian or plant-based. We, you can see a lot of examples here of the way it's being introduced, like the jackfruit tacos. Um, I won't go into all these examples, but what I would say here is that, you know, one of the things that we're up against now is what do you call all this? Because if you're saying it's chicken, but it's really not chicken, you know, is that going to become, you know, it's, I, I have a little bit of an issue with it myself, as Candace knows, because I'm like, it's not chicken. But, um, but, you know, I think coming up with things that taste like or substitutes is great. And I would just say here, the opportunity is major. So uh, keep, keep in mind, as you, again, as you're reopening, as you're looking at your food service programs, this plant-based movement. Okay, on to Candace. And the last one here, we still care about sustainability and food waste. Um, and I think that this is one that, um, you know, pre-pandemic was obviously on our minds, right? You know, we saw lots of um, things about reduce and reuse. We saw that's a pasta straw there. Um, we saw lots of zero footprint uh, uh, initi uh, initiatives. Um, we work went vegetarian, right? So in, and that was connected um, to, to kind of plant-based sustainability. So the idea is that, you know, we cared, right? And then in 2020, um, the beginning of 2020, we didn't want to touch anything that anyone else had touched. And so um, that leaves us with this, you know, um, lots of single use plastic. We all saw empty shelves. You know, we saw unharvested fields and, you know, the, the disconnect in our food system where we really were like, wow, you know, how can we have empty shelves and then animals being euthanized? A lot of people didn't, uh, who didn't have knowledge about how our food system really works. These were surprising things, um, you know, and so, and we saw delivery packaging becoming an issue because even when we wanted to use compostables, some communities can't compost them. They also really, we saw how completely um, ineffective they were for food service. Um, so we're going to wrap up here, um, but you can see that you know, we're on a path to sustainability. And so we're seeing reusable cups and we're seeing people with a greater tolerance for imperfect produce and hydroponics. And, um, and so we, we think that, you know, we'll see packaging, food waste and, you know, more localized food systems as, as part of the future. Um, and I'll take it oh. home. Uh, you know, just as we wrap that one up, I want to really challenge all of you to think about when you go back to full service and you're going to have uh, back to Marie's presentation, there's going to be people floating in and out of the offices based on their flexible schedules. You know, what can you do? You know, you in the past, it's been lush buffets and lots of food and everything. But I think we 2020 has given us a chance to redefine waste and how we can still have delicious offerings, but we can do it in a way where we're not throwing out a lot of it at the end of the night or it goes bad or whatever. So I'll leave that. So I'm going to ask you all to take with you uh, what are you going to leave behind for good? You know, like something, you know, that you were, that you're not going to do anymore because of what happened in 2020. What are you going to take with you? 
And how can you mark 2020 as the year your organization refined, redefined hospitality for the future? We're not going to answer all those questions today, but we've been pondering all of that. And I think the good news is you're going to leave some behind because we've learned a lot this year and you're going to take a lot with you. So we hope you, we gave you just a glimpse into four key trends that we saw that are going to come through this with uh, silver linings, but there's a lot more. And, uh, and we thank you all for this opportunity to chat with you. And, you know, we look forward to hearing your questions and to uh, perhaps speaking again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Candice and Andrew. Um, Demi Moore actually said, I like to connect to people in the virtual world, exchanging thoughts and ideas, when in the physical world, we might never have the opportunity to cross paths. Mm -hmm. You raised points that even in virtual connection is still a connection, and we have seen the power of people connecting virtually, whether it's to discuss merits of home baking or raise support and awareness to address bias and prejudice. Um, so thank you so much. All right, so keeping an eye on the clock here, um, over to Q&A. Um, and I have a bunch of some great questions coming in. I put mine down, actually. Uh, there was one, all right, here we go. Um, so Andrew and Candice, uh, based on the trends that you're saying, what actions can we take now to strengthen engagement with our customers as employees return to work? You want to take that one, Andrew? Or like we do? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Candice. I'm, 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 I'm pondering it. I may chime in. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I think what we're seeing is really um, comes still comes down to great hospitality and what that you know what the what you know your, the food and beverage spaces is in the workplace are really places to connect. And so, what does that mean in terms of you know the kinds of offerings that are available? You know, are there? Is it um, and and, and how is it delivered? You know, at the end of the day, it really comes down to that that hospitality connection and and it's the same thing that makes a great restaurant experience you know do i believe that the person that has prepared this has prepared this because they care about me and am i going to enjoy eating it um yeah. so i'll throw in i'm ready candace i'm ready to throw in um so ah, i do i, I do think you know the, the term surprise and delight gets a little overused but i think you know every every everything that you deliver or present should have a moment of like that was thoughtful that was authentic i really got that and then I would also throw in that as people are coming back to work, you know, the restaurant industry has just been devastated. So, you know, it's okay to maybe give your, you know, give the employees some credits to go out and dine or to do other things that, you know, that really um, pop up the financial community around these locations. So, you know, restaurant recovery, I think is big and any company should figure out how to keep that going. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Marie, um, is the data showing a shift to more time in the office post-COVID reflecting the workers' preference or what they expect their employers to do? The data that I have presented you reflect the workforce preferences, um, but they are also um, luckily uh, joining employers' uh, preferences at the moment. I mean, certainly we think that um, most of the clients that we work with want uh, return to the office to, uh, you know, to happen. And that's why they're putting a very significant emphasis on, the, on uh, um, you know, hospitality, human experience services, amenities. I mean, we're seeing a significant increase of uh, demand from the workforce, uh, you know, around this topic. Uh, so yes, it's uh, it seems to be converging into the same direction, and that's why I'm hoping that the next uh, survey that I will do um, after the publication of the um, you know the March 2021 survey, the one in September, is going to confirm the trend, and that uh, we will be then looking with uh, Andrew and Candace at uh, uh, offering uh, services to uh, to the workforce. Um, which actually are authentic, uh, inclusive, um, are human. I think this is uh, one of the key things which we're hearing. Uh, people yeah. want places which are human mm -hmm. and authentic. So. Great. Thank you. Um, Andrew and Candice, a uh, question for you. Um, how do you feel the hybrid model will impact food service management companies on the premise, you know, with feeding? And do you see then a new model of, um, of food service coming through? I'll take and how is this going to, oh, mm -hmm. sorry, and how is this going to impact the jobs in the food service environment? 
Well, there's a couple of different things. I'll let Candace talk a little bit about, you know, the, the robotic uh, piece of this. But um, I would say that um, in general, um, it's really going to be, you know, part of working at all those wonderful companies is the food service programs that they used to get, right? You know, the cafeterias were the rage, you know, and all, you know, everybody loved that. I think they will come back. I think they just have to come back maybe in a, in a more thoughtful boxed lunch style, introducing culinary talent into like, we're going to do pop-ups here with a diverse talent. You know, I think there's going to have to be a thoughtfulness about what, you know, is excess the best way to do this or can it be much more tailored and refined? So I would say that that's going to come back and there will be jobs with that. Um, Candice, you want to talk a little bit about how like, you know, certain companies are introducing robotic solutions because the salad bars, everybody are probably gone for good. Well, maybe not in every market. Candice keeps saying to me what's happening in the middle of the country, their salad bars are back already, but on the coast, they're not yet. And I don't think it's a bad thing for salad bars, maybe not to come back, but um, I'll let Candice finish this one up. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely seeing that, you know, um, robotic vending, I guess you'd call it, you know, has an opportunity in hospitals or places where there's a 24-7 need for food service, but yet, you know, you're not, you're not going to staff for that 24-7 need. And so, you know, I think there's, there's definitely, it comes, I think, from what Dr. Marie was saying, you know, about this focus on employee wellness and, you know, wanting people to be well-nourished for, for many reasons, Um and so, you know, it will be interesting. I don't, I don't know that we have uh, enough information to really know what those kinds of, uh, you know, food service experiences will be as it relates to the hybrid model. M my instinct would be that if, if I'm, ho I'm, I'm home and I'm tired of, you know, making my own lunch, but I know I can go to the office and there's something wonderful there and my colleagues are there and I might grab a bite with somebody I like. Maybe that's, you know, kind of a, another motivator to bring it, me into or, the- or, or, or maybe you let them take it home for tomorrow on the day they're working at home. You know, so I think that it's it's going to be reinvented for this new model that Marie, you know, talked about. Great. Thank you. And I think I've got time just for one last quick question, uh, Dr. Marie. Um, are we putting ourselves at a disadvantage if you want to be working from home compared to a colleague or a customer who's in the office? Um, do you see there are going to be new rules of etiquette? Oh, that's an excellent question, which I've never been asked before. Uh, but um, yes, I think uh, it's something we need to think about carefully. It very much will depend on the culture of the organization. I mean, hopefully we are now shifting into a world where it doesn't matter where you work from. Um, it, what matters is how you work. And, uh, you know, remember, work is something you do, it's not somewhere you go to. Uh, and I think as much as, uh, you know, hybrid is going to bring, bring new ways of working, the leadership mindset also need to shift uh, at the same time to accommodate, um, you know, hybrid work to be uh, embraced uh, without any compromise, without any uh, um, uh, differences across uh, either gender or, uh, or different, uh, you know, uh, persona. I think that's that's what is most uh, important. But uh, yes, and um, I think if you read the media at the moment, you probably have seen some companies who are very vocal about uh, return to the office. This is what I want. I'm the CEO and I want uh, this back when, you know, the workforce out there has built some strength over the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. They have been heard and uh, we need to uh, listen to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Dr. Marie, Candice, Andrew, for such a great session today. Uh, last words from me. Uh, the biggest communication problem is we do not listen to understand. We listen to reply. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, back to you, Damien. Thank you, Dr. Marie, Candice, and Andrew for an excellent session. And thank you, Justin, for serving as our host this afternoon. Uh, a couple of things I wrote down and took away from it too, Dr. Marie, the human-centric approach and design that is certainly going to be key in how all of us engage with our employees, their, therefore our customers as they return back into the office. And in everything, there's opportunity. Uh, Andrew, that sounds like a much more eloquent way of saying what I always tell my kids, which is even if you fall on your face, at least you're moving forward. So there is always a chance to learn from everything that goes on, be it positive or negative. Following today's event, uh, you will receive a session evaluation in your email. In that email, you will also find 
the trends report that Andrew and Candace shared, and I know you will find that very interesting and a great takeaway from today's session. Now, I'd like to take this time to announce the CIC raffle winners uh, with apologies in advance for any mispronunciations. They are Emilia Eckes, Amy Bendikovitz, Ben Anderson, Brigitte Saki, Carolyn Malaya, Drew Golly, Heather Liana, Kimberly Badinelli, Laura Lentz, Lori Grippo Tessariero, Michael Shapiro, Nathan Phillips, Rob Yayak, Rob Gephardt, and Sharon Iliatambi. If you're one of those lucky winners, you will receive an email about your prize and how you can claim it, so keep an eye out for that. Congratulations to all of our winners and thank you to our members, speakers, and the Academy for Hospitality Arts for your generous donations, as well as to our sponsor companies who provided these great raffle prizes. Before we sign off, I do want to remind everyone about our upcoming SHFM events. To make it easy, we're going to put the link into the SHFM events page in the chat so you can find details about these events and more importantly, register. Don't miss the CIC special interest sessions for operators and young professionals on May 4th and May 6th, respectively. Although CIC series is coming to a close, SHFM will continue offering events all year long. Join us on May 13th for the Reconstituting the Food Service Workforce virtual event. And please save the date for these other virtual events. Creating workplace hospitality value through neuroimaging on May 26th. Our first ever SHFM town hall on June 15th and a conversations that matter series session on June 23rd. We're also looking forward to two exciting in-person events. So please save the dates for the Young Professional Summit in New York City on September 22nd and the National Conference, December 6th to 8th at the beautiful Omni Amelia Island Resort in my hometown of Amelia Island, Florida. Plans are underway for an SHFM homecoming reunion event like no other. And I'm not sure I'm supposed to say anything about this yet, but uh, just between us, be on the lookout for an email next week on how you can book your hotel room. And hold on. No, Peg, I am not giving away any top secret information they can know about being able to book the hotel room. Uh, thank you again, everybody, and I hope to see my entire SHFM family again very soon.